you have come today and uh, are taking this tour with us. Um, I hope you'll not only enjoy it this morning, but also that you will come back and explore on your own or just sit here and hang out, um, which I do sometimes. Um, so in RL, uh, my name is Linda Kelly, and my work is in consulting mostly with uh, companies and uh, nonprofits regarding sustainability, and a lot about recently the the human side of sustainability, how you lead, how you get things done. But my love and interest has always been in the environmental side. So um, I have been doing these habitat builds now in Second Life for 10 years. And I am a habitat curator here at the Abyss. We have a lot of ocean-related exhibits here. Um, some surface, some undersea, some are the technologies 
Some are the plants, animals, and life of the sea. All you have to do is take a quick look around and you'll know that there is much to see here. Um, so this tour is only going to be a very, very brief introduction. And today we will explore three undersea habitats. Those are a tropical undersea coral reef and the surrounding um, coastal area, a kelp forest and the surrounding coastal area there also, and a subarctic habitat with a deep sea coral reef. The habitats are representative. There is no way that any habitat in Second Life could be a total and complete representation. So rather than trying to do a replication, we've put in some of the key elements, some of the the plants, animals, flora, fauna um, of, that are representative of a type of ecosystem. So if you live in any of these kinds of um, areas in RL, you may recognize some of the things, but not all of the things. So, for instance, in the coral, the tropical coral reef, not all of those um, plants and animals may be together in a particular RL location. Note that each of the habitats has both prey and predator species. And that's important because you cannot have a healthy ecosystem if you don't have both of those. And in RL, we have, in many places, tried to eliminate the, the predator species. So on, on land, that would be bears and wolves and tigers and lions. Um, Under sea, sharks are severely stressed. But it has, it has very negative effects on the total income, uh, ecosystem when you do that. So rather than me stand here and talk at people, we're going to go on a tour. And we're going to start with the tropical area, which is uh, to my left here. So it is the uh, it is the actual north no south side of the this island because we are on a small island. Uh, so luckily, because uh, from where I am in the northern hemisphere, the tropical is south of me. So. If you look down to where that is, you'll notice that the tropical shoreline is covered with mangroves. There are also palm trees. There is uh, one um, eucalyptus regnans, which is typical of this, the Australian uh, Tasmanian coast, but not of other places. But that is also there because it is a, a key species. So let's take a walk down along here. Uh, 
onto the path. Looks like we have most of the people down here. So while we're waiting a minute, take a look around. Um, what do you notice? Does this look anything like your coastal area at home? Or does it look entirely different? You'll see some plants, some birds. Yeah, entirely different in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is uh, like and the same as I am in the northeastern part of the United States. Uh, the Netherlands is uh, in the temperate zone. So we don't have mangroves either. So let's walk down the stairs here or jump off the, uh, the boardwalk and, and onto the beach. <laughs> no, the ocean doesn't reach Chicago, but uh, the... Lake Michigan has a lot of the um, properties of an ocean because it is so very, very large. Yes, and, and Florida uh, still has some mangroves. The, the coasts of Florida would have had many, many, many more mangrove areas naturally. So take a look around here at the beach area. Um, what do you see? What do you notice here? In addition to the mangroves, what do you notice? There are uh, somewhat over 300 species of mangroves, by the way. Yeah. yeah, there are a few different kinds of crabs. The birds. There's grasses and there's also the mangroves put up air roots. So mixed into the grass, it's hard to see, are, are air roots. Um, yeah. uh, if you look over a little bit behind, Right where Aaron is sitting. Ah, what's he patting? 
This is something you could not do in RL. <laughs> One of the beauties of, of Second Life. So you see that mangrove forests are uh, home to a richly diverse set of shore species. So are the coral reefs and the kelp forests. In a very, very real sense, these are our cradles of sea life. This is the nurseries where most of the sea creatures start their lives. Sadly, due to human activity, all of these are now under stress. Oh, we just had a, a brown pelican fly overhead. And that's also typical. Yeah, the coral reefs are bleaching and they are bleaching from heat and from acid, acidification and from pollution. So when a coral reef bleaches, it not only kills the coral, but it's removing the, uh, the symbiotic algae that the coral depend on. So we forget because the temperature in uh, our land areas has been uh, pretty steady for most of our lifetimes we tend to think that that is the way it has always been. That is not the way it has always been. And we, human beings and other species, have evolved to be um, functioning within a certain temperature range. So we, if you were in, say, um, a minus 5 centigrade or 20 Fahrenheit, you would have, you would, and you had no clothes and you had no heat, you would be, you wouldn't live very long. You would freeze. If you were in, again, um, 150 degrees Fahrenheit and you had no protection. You wouldn't live very long. So human beings are sensitive to, to temperature as well as all of the sea creatures are. So for this tour, you of course may walk along the boardwalk, but we really suggest that you either take the uh, the tube that Jan has put here. So there is an underwater walking tube that pretty much circles the island. Or, uh, and this is another wonderful feature of Second Life, you can go into the water in your clothes and come out and you won't even be wet. So um, I am going to go just step off the the edge and down into the coral reef earlier. <laughs> yeah, you got to be careful of those crocs, yeah. <laughs> but the the crocodile is here because that is the, one of the um one of the top predators in these coastal areas. So yes, you can walk down there if you wish, or you can uh, join me underwater. There is underwater a, uh, a rock, if you don't have a swimming AO. And the, the rock, the wing song rock in each of the habitats will give you a, a swimming animation. Um, 
But we really believe here, and this is one of the reasons we've done this, that the experiential part of Second Life is one of its real beauties and an extremely important feature. So, the world under sea here looks a lot different than the world on land. The animals are different. There's not a lot of plant life at the moment here on this tropical reef. Um, and the coral reefs are communities and many of them thousands of years old. One of the reasons that I build these habitats is for the experiential value. That there is, if we are going to have a world that supports us as human beings, we cannot be alone. We need to have, we are part of ecosystems, healthy or not, that, and supporting coral reefs is one of the ways that we support a functional ecosystem and it has to do not only with the uh, the life of the sea because uh, a billion people depending depend on the the fishing around the world but it also has to do with the with earth's oxygen level yeah the the jellyfish the particularly the moon jellyfish and this is an example of the representation of a habitat here. So you see the moon jellyfish, and if you look above, you will see a, 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 a giant ocean sunfish, a trevally. So the jellyfish are the most favorite food of, of the uh, trevally. So that we've tried in each of the habitats to place the, uh, the predators and the prey that would naturally go together, together. So what are some of the things you see around here? What's drawing your attention? Yeah, the, the, some of the corals are naturally white, but most of the ones in a tropical setting have algae that help with the, uh, it's a symbiotic relationship where the algae feed the coral and the coral feed the algae. So when you see the white areas where the it's totally missing the polyps. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, here we have the tiger sharks. Uh, we have other sharks. We have turtles. We have... Placing um, a complete... Building any kind of a complete ecosystem 
requires that you have both the prey and predator. And I'm going to keep saying that because so often that isn't done and it's so important. Yeah, the humpback whales are interesting. They are, uh, they're um, migratory. So they have ra a range of thousands of miles. The other thing here is that there are um, levels of prey predator. So that some of the jackfish will eat some of the smaller fish and the uh, humans fish the jackfish. Yeah, and, and uh, Di, the, the boom bust is very important too, and particularly regarding human activity, because in the coastal areas, the close coastal areas where human waste or fertilizer from agriculture is uh, drains into the coastal areas, you have uh, a boom or bloom of algae that then is food for some of the uh, creatures on the the lower lower on the the eating chain um, but that moves all the way up the chain and when that stops say uh, off season for agricultural runoff then the algae population crashes and the things that feed all the way up the chain on that have no food and die out. So when the dead, when the creatures die, the decomposition sucks the oxygen out of the water and then you have a low oxygen dead zone along the coast. And you'll find this in coastal areas all over the world. Yes, raw sewage does the same. That That is absolutely true. And uh, pollution um, all over the world. So you'll find off India, you'll find off China, you'll find off many places in South America, you'll find off in the Gulf Coast, off uh, Louisiana, that the fish that we would eat 
are dangerously polluted. So we have two other habitats to look at, and we certainly encourage people to come back and explore this and even just hang out here in the tropical, uh, on the tropical chorus, uh, floor, coral reef. But since each of these habitats is distinct, let's move on to the kelp forest. Okay, Roundup. We can even discuss that as we move along here because uh, the glycophase, which is the Roundup chemical, it, it, it uh, is not as bad in the water at this time as it is on land. Um, it does eventually decompose, but that it come, is moving up the food chain is a problem. Um, more, though, than that at this time is plastic pollution, and I, I should mention that here as well, that the plastic gets dumped and most of the fish that have been tested from around the world now have plastic. Yeah, the plastic doesn't decompose, it just breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. Yeah, so we have a plastic soup. So take a minute to look around the kelp forest, and what do you see here?
it's clearly a very different habitat from the tropical coral reef. I've got a great white shark right in my face. <laughs> Lucky it's already eaten or I'd be in trouble. So, although we call this a forest, it isn't really trees. Kelp are um, algae. So algae can come in teeny, teeny infinitesimal forms or in the large, extensive forms. Um, these particular brown kelp, uh, they're mostly brown, although there, there are some green and some, even though some of the brown looks rather green. Um, these are frequently found off the temperate coasts. And they are also at risk. So you notice here again we have prey and predator uh, species. We have shellfish, we have crabs, we have lobster, we have um, starfish. We have some tube anemone. We have uh, one of the key species here is um, sardines. So you might have sardines in some places. You might have anchovy, uh, menhaden in other places. And this is a key species because so much of the food chain depends on these. And uh, talk about stress. Um, there seems to be cycles of, of uh, boom and bust for sardines, but the sardine population around the world right now seems to be crashing. There's a lot of indication that it is crash, crashing. And that's very scary because sardines are a keystone species. It's not clear why. Often fish populations crash when they are under-regulated and um, the fish are caught and removed from the ecosystem before they are of reproductive age. That happened with cod and haddock around the world. Um, luckily, that most of, many of those populations have returned due to regulations around the world. Uh, the sea, which many uh, countries have signed on to, is a very important agreement. Unfortunately, the United States is not a signatory. No, it's not do No, uh, it's not due to 
Trump. It's way before that. This was, it was originally uh, put out in the late 70s, and uh, the United States Congress did not ratify it at that time. And so the United States has never become a signatory. Many of the other countries of the world are, which is very lucky. Uh, yeah, tagline, it's, th this has happened other places too. Cod and Haddock are very, very important uh, for the economy of the North Atlantic and, and also over millennia, people have um, depended on those species just for, for food. So I can tell you what happened in the, this is again in the late 70s, in off George's Bank, which is the uh, Cape Cod Bay, Gulf of Maine, in the North, Atla North Atlantic, um, on the U.S. coast. And there weren't regulations, um, and they were, they wiped out an entire year class of haddock, and the population crashed. Um, luckily, the state and federal government caught it and put restrictions on fishing of haddock, and it did come back, but it was touch and go for a while there. And, and I was actually working with some of those agencies at the time. I mean, so it's, uh, yeah. So I'm very much familiar with, with that instance. And it seems that the, a similar thing is happening um, off Scotland in the UK. You might notice over here that there are um, a group of sardines, schooling sardines, that are being chased by a school of bluefish. This happens often. This is one of the prey-predator activities in the uh, temperate undersea and in the kelp forests. Yeah, and this is, a, again, tagline, one of the values of Second Life and to be able to show this because most people are not going to go undersea in the solid world. But out of sight, out of mind is very much operational. So if you are standing on the shoreline and you look out over the ocean, you don't see all of this life underneath. And if you don't see it, if you don't have that kind of experience, it's hard to value it or harder to value it. So one of my real hopes is to use this setting here at the Abyss uh, as other virtual platforms come along, perhaps some of those as well, to be able to give people a touch and a taste of what an undersea environment actually is, what it to get connected to it. Yeah, and and if you don't know it, if you can't see it, you, it's hard to realize it is not infinite. It is finite. Oh, sharks up there. Check it out, you all. Yeah, some of the plastic waste, trash, um, is visible. But much of it has now degraded to the point where 
it's not visible, but they have taken uh, certainly the the larger animals, the the fish, the turtles that have um, died because they've eaten the plastic, uh, seagulls as well, um, and if they are dissected, their stomachs are full of plastic waste. It's just it's it's horrid. But as worrisome as that as that is that the the smaller fish are having trouble distinguishing between uh, the tiny tiny p bits of plastic and other uh, diatoms and and things they would eat. So that they are now finding plastic not only in the stomachs of creatures as it goes up the, the food chain, but in the muscles, in the meat. Uh, so the microplastic is in some of the fish we eat. It's also getting into our water supply on land. This is this is a really, really serious problem. Yeah, uh, there is some um, some research that looks promising about uh, microbes that digest plastic. I certainly hope that pans out because there is no possible way that we are going to be able to collect all of the plastic for cleanup. Yeah, so if you would want to uh, provide a little bit more uh, information about those microbes, yeah, I'm sure people would be very interested. Yeah, some of the plastic has uh, acts as it has uh, some of the chemicals in the plastics act as a um, estrogen simul uh, simulated estrogen. So some of them, but not all of them, are hormone disruptors, um, and this is certainly shown up in the frog populations along the coast. Yes. So distinct as this is from the tropical coral reef, um, and there are many more things to explore here, and it's not only undersea, but you'll notice that the coastal area here is very different than the the mangrove swamp or uh, forest. You'll find deciduous trees, you'll find different kinds of animals and birds up there. Um, there's also a, a nice sitting beach, and so please do even come back with colleagues and hold meetings there or gatherings of friends. The little the uh, seashells on the beach are in fact seeds. So you are we encourage you all to use this to keep in touch with these habitats. To let the experience move you. We have one more habitat to explore here for today, and that is, uh, until recently, people thought that corals were solely tropical. Turns out there are many, many, 
many cold water coral reefs as well. So let's continue moving along. Got a shark following me. Now, before we even talk about the coral reef, as you if you look beyond and below. You'll find uh, sperm whales, humpback whales. You'll find the sperm whale with its favorite food, squid. There may actually be more variation in uh, coral species in deep water than we currently are aware of. Um, the, these reefs are never see the light of day. These are dark reefs. So you'll notice here what we have done, and this may change as research changes. But the since they aren't they full of algae, they are not bright colors here. I'm going to show this. Uh, because not everybody has gotten here. There are feather corals. There are some of the, the polyp corals. There are some of the, uh, the fans. You'll notice that the crab population here is different. Whoa! Just got bumped by a sperm whale. So there are many subtle differences. In addition to the uh, the small fish. Um, <sighs> so 
So the small, the cold water areas are full of plankton, and plankton are the main. They are tiny, tiny, tiny plants and animals um, that you have trouble seeing. You might see them as a mist, but not much more than that for the most part in in the waters. But this is the primary food of some of the huge whales. So any of the baleen whales uh, are plankton feeders. So the baleen acts, instead of teeth, the baleen is a uh, like a sieve. It doesn't let them, that when the whale has opened its mouth and brought in the water, the plankton cannot get out again when the whale closes its mouth. That's a good question. If they don't have the symbiotic algae, um, the research is not complete yet, but it seems that uh, just as happens with some of the um, the hot vents underwater, that the the um, gases that they draw on the the gases and the chemicals in the gases in the water for their uh, sustenance. But as the research continues, I'm sure we will know much more about that. On the shore here, if you look up at the coast here, you'll find that it's very different again. Um, you'll notice that there are uh, orcas there. There are seals there. Orcas eat seals. Seals eat a lot of the, the fish and shellfish around here. Uh, you'll notice that the coast is different. It's not particularly sandy. It's more pebbly. Uh, you don't have the deciduous trees. You have the, the evergreens, the conifers, um, and not even pines. You have more spruces, uh, more cold weather plants and animals. There are caribou or moose. Um, there's a wolf, bear. Bears are pretty much omnivores. They eat the berries. They eat the they fish. Um, Again, you have the, the prey predator where the, there is the edge of the ecosystem where the land animals interact with the, the ocean animals. Uh, <clears throat> there are no penguins here. Penguins are not Arctic. They are native to the southern hemisphere and uh, there isn't all that much yeah so I uh, we've chosen here to do Arctic because it has more of a range of uh, 
undersea and land. Now, this whole habitat is what would be really severely negatively impacted were there to be uh, drilling for oil in the Arctic, which has been proposed by the United States and by Russia. <clears throat> because these are very deep water habitats, it would be almost impossible to clean up any spills. And these areas would be devastated. Again, this kind of an area is a nursery area for many, many of the, uh, the sea species. Although the whales, for instance, the gray whales will um, mate and birth, uh, mate in the uh, Baja, the Gulf of California, you know, they spend much of their time up here in the cold water. They grow, they eat, they mature up here. Now, we have come to the end of our hour. I am most happy to stay around and answer questions if you would wish. Um, this, as I said in the beginning, is by no means a, a complete picture but we wanted very much to give you a, a taste of what we've done here and to uh, encourage you to come back and explore and use it. Use it in your work. Use it for fun. Um, because we here at the Abyss believe this is uh, critical to human sustainability. As you can see, I'm sure you can tell I am passionate about this, uh, and uh, you know, it's part of my life's work. So, and I'm just delighted to have been able to share it with you today. Oh, thank you, Stefano. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Please do bring friends. Yes.
yes, and tagline, that's one of the things that I hope to, I, I have, hope to do with this ongoingly. And uh, we need to raise awareness. It's hard to value something that you don't even know exists. Oh, thank you, Chantel. Thank you very much.
it is. The dog just came in. So far, anyway, Second Life has so many advantages that other virtual platforms just don't have. Uh, it's not a game. It's a... Uh, the only place so far where people can really create their own... Um, their own places and have this kind of diversity. All of the other places so far are highly programmed in one way or another. <laughs> 